uh, a company that has a, a sugar alternative. So there are a lot of sugar alternatives out there, but the problem with, with those alternatives is that they don't, don't have really the bulk of the sugar, so you cannot really cook with it. And, and also, a lot of them are still not that cost competitive. And so this one is one of them. I'm trying to think about other ones uh, that are in the food. Like, what is that one based on? Uh, you know what? The guy's pretty secretive about it, so uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so yeah, and so now, as I mentioned, like the alternative protein fund, so we're really investing a lot. I mean, the fund is to invest a lot in everything that is uh, uh, cellular agriculture fund based. Okay. Um, so, and for the food tech, how many food tech founders do we have in the audience? Who who are food tech? Uh? <laughs> okay. I one. <laughs> okay, mm, just one. Okay, all right. Well, well, for maybe there are others who are who may end up being food tech founders also in the audience. Actually, there are more. I just there's more. I see some people actually. Um, so we do have more, <laughs> just not all. Um, okay. So for the food tech founders and people who may end up being food tech founders in the audience, you know, what are the top things um, you look for and that you recommend that they do to be considered as a candidate uh, for your investing, for your programs? And um, you know, how should they spend their time? How early should they start to fundraise? What should they do to stand out? All of that. Uh, sure. I guess uh, the first thing, given we you know, have a biotech life science background, um, we look for IP as an underpinning or plan to get IP. So um, a lot in Kind of plant based in CPG can sometimes be more about the brand, and even if you have IP, it will eventually be about the brand. Mm -hmm. So, we're thinking about things that have um, clear defensibility and like an unfair advantage in how they're produced. Um, so, a lot of it could be um, energy efficiency, um, footprint, uh, climate wise, um, just maybe has health claims or benefits that aren't available elsewhere. Um, and it can really depend where in the food stack if it's consumer facing, um, you know, for farmers or for big industry, like a B2B thing. Those are all kind of different, so I would say, um, kind of vague, but it's where I would start off at, um, is IP. The other was around when to start fundraising. Yeah, just, um, I guess in general. Uh, things to do, that would be I would say, um, for... very, very quickly, get to a prototype. So start finding ways to actually make the food, tasting it, seeing the properties, um, how people react to it. Um, talk to customers very quickly, whether it's people, you know, go stand outside the mall food court, or outside, you know, during lunch hour, and like, Give people your stuff and see how they like film them, see how they react. Um, when it comes to investors, I would say, I mean, I would focus on, I would not focus on that as much if you don't have a, a prototype or a, a plan for a prototype and IP. Um, but getting to know people and investment typically is relationships. So you want to build that over time and let them see the velocity of your company. So showing momentum and change and quick delta is more important than being at a really like awesome place because then you know if they see the hockey stick begin they're going to extrapolate and assume that it's going to continue that way so that's why relationships would be big yeah so quite similarly we also look at companies that really have uh defensibility um so we we we're a company that is very firm that is very technology um uh Centric, so we really like to see companies that have um, a strong technological component that can have IP that other people cannot replicate. So we tend to not invest uh, in CPG um, unless really the product is really the next big thing and it's amazing and there is defensibility around it to some extent. Um, and then um, when it comes to the kind of companies that we look at, we uh, you know the, the way that uh, Rob like one of the two partners he likes to think about it is that uh, the question is, is it uh, more of a vitamin or a painkiller? So is it something that's just gonna enhance people's lives a little bit, or is it something that's going to have like a fundamental change in people's lives, uh, in society, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we really look at those companies that have the potential of having a strong impact. And, and you know, um, I also like the concept of zero to one, which is a book by Peter Thiel. I know it's very controversial, so and I don't agree with all of his arguments in the book either, but I really like the idea, that's how we look at it, is that we want companies that go from really from nothing that, that doesn't exist into something that like zero to one, from zero to one, and we don't want a company that's like, like one to n, so something that people are already familiar with, so it's something that, you know, that is already out there. So an example um, I like to think about is, uh, 
So, you know, there's Impossible Burger, um, which is amazing. And then now Nestle, for example, came out with a burger that at first they were going to call Incredible Burger, and now they decide to call it Awesome Burger. So <laughs> ne Nestle was able to get away with it because they're Nestle. But if a startup had come to us and said, like, oh, we're doing the Incredible Burger or we're doing the Awesome Burger, that's clearly something that we would not be interested in because, you know, we don't want something that's just an imitation product or something that it's just a marginal improvement potentially. Um, and when it comes to fundraising, I think that, that you know, investors, I mean, a, a lot of investors, at least us, we like to really get to know the companies very early on, especially as we're investing quite early. So, so we do want to be, you know, the first ones to identify the next, you know, the next Beyond Burger or the next Beyond Meat. Uh, we do want to identify the next one. So I would recommend always not necessarily fundraising in the sense that you're going to look for a check from somebody, but more uh, like get to know investors, network, go to those events, like go like, you know, have a call with an investor and pitch, you know, potentially if you have a little bit of a, of a product or an idea and see what is the response there and, you know, go to networking event, talk to people, etc. So the fundraising process is not, to me, it's not just about the check, it's about who, who do you know. And then when you're ready, the, all you have to do is really email your network and, and see you know, why catch it. Okay, um, all right, and so in the, so kind of taking a few steps back, um, or looking at food tech from a bird's eye view, uh, what are the top three to five themes being invested in across the food tech spectrum? And, and among those, what appears to be a fad, you know, versus like a real thing? Um, I would say, in my mind, it's kind of an old trend, but I mean, I think cell-based meats have come up and they're like in probably mid-peak hype, hype cycle. So all the companies making, right now there's a bunch of companies who are making animal protein without the animal, um, without a really a differentiation of their technology and what they're doing. But a lot of investors who like one or two years ago told us like, this will never work. We don't really invest in that, like are jumping on board. So people are kind of getting fomo and it's such, I mean, FOMO yeah. in VC is like a total thing. It's 100% um, yeah. a thing. Um, really big in food right now, in particular. Um, so I think just the asymmetric bet, like putting one bet down in a company that can maybe replace meat or take part of like a trillion dollar industry, like every VC fund just wants to have a bet placed in there, I think. Um, and a lot of those probably will not survive through Series A. Um, there'll be probably a big squeeze, but that's still big. Um, a lot of people are talking about like food as medicine, functional functional foods. Um, I don't think everyone has a clear idea of what that is or how they're defining it, but um, having like a certain ingredient on the label, I think right now mushrooms are like the it product, you see ratio on everything that doesn't even make sense always, and doses that aren't actually real. Um, but functional foods like that are big. Um, I think there'll be a, a lot more, um, I think sustainability and actually climate change is gonna dictate a lot more food stuff, particularly in agriculture. Um, it's a place where we're, we're looking quite a bit. Um, so thinking of how are things um, able to sequester or pick up carbon. So like our bet on a company growing rice in the ocean is partially around methane emissions. A company taking carbon dioxide and turning it into protein using bacteria is around carbon emissions um, as things that are gonna drive that, um, getting carbon credits and also as um, arable land and resources become more difficult, I think that's going to be another big squeeze. Um, that's a different part of food tech, for sure, much less consumer facing. Um, so those are three that I would look at quite a bit. Um, more you talk, I'll think of more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of this and also, so I think more generally, I, I mean, obviously, as you have all the guests, I really like the alternative protein space, but more generally is the synthetic biology, so how do we really use biology to create like ingredients and products. Um, so alternative protein, a lot of the cell agriculture is within this category. Um, there's also a lot of uh, personalization that we're seeing. So actually, what, I'm, I'm curious, so what, what so it, within alternative proteins for you um, specifically, what what is the most exciting thing? To me, it's, so there's plant-based and then there is a cellular agriculture and cellular agriculture can further be split into two categories. One which is the acellular category, which is basically you use cells to produce an ingredient or to, use, to do something like chloric foods, for example. And then there's more of the cultured meat, which is you actually use the cells as a product. So I'm very excited about the cellular agriculture as a whole, so acellular and cultured meat. 
Um, plant-based, I'm very excited about it, that it's happening, but I feel like there's a lot, a lot of noise right now, and also the, the barriers to entry are not as high as they are for uh, cellular agriculture, where you really need a strong scientific team, you need IT. Uh, plant-based, you know, I'm, I'm very excited. I, I would love to discover the next Beyond Meat, and uh, that there's so much noise. Like we, like most of the, the startups that pitch to us are plant-based, and, and it's really, again, the zero to one thing. It's, um, so yeah, so very excited about cellular agriculture. Um, and so are you are you saying that you are rejecting the no, other no. plant the plant based ones that are pitching because they still seem like they are not distinguishing themselves? No, no, no. As long as, so we're still obviously looking at them. I'm just saying that yeah. there's a lot, a lot of noise in it, and so yeah. it's really um, it can be a little difficult for investors. Um, you know, they, in many cases, those companies around the world you cannot really taste the product. You know. Uh, I, I know that, for example, Beyond Meat, when they talk to investors and people um, who, who they're partnering with, as soon as they tasted the product, they're like, that's amazing, right? And so, yes, we do want to taste, uh, we are tasting those products, we are going through this, but I feel like the process is a little bit slower and a little bit more um, noisy, like with companies that are trying to get into it as well. I'm not saying that we're not investing, it's, it's, it's part of our investment thesis, I guess I'm a little bit less... Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said it, I'm less excited. I'm still excited about some of them, but not, not excited about the entire, ever. yeah. Anyway, so, uh, so to go back to the trends, yeah, so personalization is big. Um, so, you know, um, I think really the, the idea of like food is a medicine and really trying to, um, I think we're moving towards uh, an era that is a little bit less hedonistic, which is like we don't eat foods because they only taste good, but also because you know there are some values and and especially now like the the next customers right now the biggest ones are, are going to be millennials and generation z and it's all about what does this product do for me what does it do for the planet for society so it's more about you know values um and then the other question was uh, uh what's a fad um so actually in interesting um there is something that's both a Fat and something that's not. So a lot of ingredients, so some of them I think are more fat and some of them are more interesting. So CBD, for example, is something that's interesting. Uh, but other ingredients, for example, like every year we see this different exotic plant that people use and it's the next like thing that everybody, you know, cover, thing covered in the news. Like, you know, there was a sai like years ago and every year there's something else. Like now there's, uh, what is it called? Um, moringa or something like this? Uh, and it's oh, moringa. Oh, moringa. And, and it's the root. It's like a tree, and so they use it as like a, uh, an ingredient. And so every year we see those, and so to me this is more of a fad because there's going to be like a new cycle around it, but it's not necessarily as investable. And the other thing that that maybe is kind of like also in between a fad and not a fad is insects. Um, so um, so insects is is interesting. Yeah. So insects is interesting, I think, for animal feed, uh, but I don't think that is as interesting for for humans. I think the market is really small and. You know, we don't really hear people say like, you know, I'm just craving crickets right now, right? So, uh, so uh, to me, it's kind of like both a fat and not a fat, like depending on how you look at it. Um, and then I don't know if you have any other. Um, the only thing, other one I would say um, is seafood. Actually, um, it's a very yeah. broad category. Algae. Um, I mean, or more than more than, more than algae, I would say yeah. um, our first foreign to seafood is actually oh yeah, new way food, which is a plant-based shrimp, and, like thinless oh, right. growing bluefin tuna in the lab. Um, we've had companies actually growing, um, cre re recreating ocean ecosystems in layers, shipping containers to grow on land where you have high sunlight. Um, but I think uh, for me, like reading about kind of how the ecosystem in the ocean is changing is actually pretty scary. I think it's a really, really big deal um, in climate change and it's going to massively change how we produce and are able to get to get seafood. Um, so uh, I think one, I mean, I don't know exactly what that means for us in the long term and how it's gonna be done, uh, but one, the ocean is a huge place where we have, as we lose land on, you know, as we lose land, the ocean is still huge. Um, and we could produce all the protein for the planet using a tiny, tiny fraction of ocean space that could do aquaculture. Um, so I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, all the sea vegetables, so to speak, um, are one, very healthy for humans and also really good for the environment, coastal defense, ecosystems for seafood. So I think that whole area is a really big opportunity. Um, and when we put some bets in, um, it's a little bit harder because it can oftentimes need um, higher initial infrastructure investment, especially if we're gonna do aquaculture or other ocean farming. 
but I'm definitely one that I would like want to keep working on a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so actually, so the thing is like, so because you, you've been looking at, uh, or your, your role as an investor has been kind of like over the last year, uh, but maybe work seeing, uh, maybe just talking to your the partners at your firm, I'm interested in hearing about, uh, you know, years ago when they saw something emerge and it wasn't yet a hot thing, and then a few years go by and then it becomes a hot thing. Can you tell us about those experiences that you guys have had in food tech or in biotech? Yeah, so so I obviously wasn't right. there, but uh, <laughs> I can tell you from the partners, and again, I keep on bringing it back to alternative protein and synthetic biology, yes, but, but this is really, um, you know, at that time, like our founder news, when it was a media company, they did an interview with Josh Fenrick, who was uh, the CEO of Hampton Creek that was going to become Just. Uh, we talked to this really, I mean, our founder talked to all these companies at the very, very early stage, and I think that 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 the surprising thing is that we didn't, it, I don't think that people at that time necessarily expected that it was going to come so fast, and that even right now, even you know, meat companies are getting into the space as well, right? They're investing in plant-based, they're investing in, in poultry meat, they have their own brands now. Um, and you know, even those meat companies now, they don't want to be known as meat companies, they want to be known as protein companies, which is a very interesting shift. So I think this is really the trend that, that our founder kind of saw coming and, and really was something that maybe a few years ago nobody would have expected. So like, do you think 2017, when did they, because when was the first fund? It was in 2017, right? Mm -hmm. But at so, the time they did like, you know, they were covering um, Active and, and Food Tech for Funder News and they were doing um, some some of the crowdfunding. Um, yeah. Other stuff. Yeah. So yeah, fortunately we didn't get, in, I mean, they didn't get into some of those early deals, but these guys did, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess Lab Road Meat would be the, the very easy example. Um, <laughs> the first one that really gained traction was Memphis Meats. Um, and that when one, did you and when did you personally um, I hear the, about it, see about uh, it? I joined the Biome Batch Two, which was when Memphis Meats was part was incubated in the program. Um, that, so, and that was when. Uh, what batch are you on now? Number nine. Nine. Okay. Um, so that was end of twenty fifteen, beginning of twenty sixteen. Okay. Um, so Memphis Meats, um, I think what was different about them is they were very open and public and speaking about it with the press very early and. I'm learning from the past mistakes. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes around, you know, science and food from GM and Monsanto and all of that. Um, very transparent, very you know, public facing, very early on. Um, having a lot of press coverage. That was one that um, gained a lot of momentum. I think it surprised a lot of people. Um, they raised you know, like three and a half million dollars in a few months while they're at a program. A couple of other companies like Gelcor raised a fair amount of money. New Wave. Um, so that whole space, like the first year to two years, it was not that many companies. It was like kind of the beginning of the curve. Finless Foods was our second one, eating fish there. Um, a few others popped up, um, I can't remember all the names right now. And then um, there was like kind of all of a sudden a jump where like a dozen companies, two dozen companies, three dozen happened very quickly. Um, I think that is the area where um, there was the most like shift we've seen within biotech where it's brought in a lot of investors who are, you know, we call crossover investors who are like from a tech software IT world who are looking more and more at bio, or people who are new who established funds entirely in food tech as a result of all protein. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, like Beyond and Impossible, definitely like, paved the way for all these like new protein companies because they've been around since like 2010. Yeah, 2009. 2010. I, I don't know about yeah. 9, 2010. Yeah, yeah, for a long time. Um, so that's the biggest one I'd say for sure. Uh, okay. And um, so, which of these? I was gonna ask, which of these ex ex um, exciting things appear to be uh, an overarching trend, um, you know, like a permanent fixture in our society? Because that's, you know, a lot of your worlds are looking at things that kind of seem like sci-fi. Um, they don't seem like they may actually, you know, see the light of day for, you know, in terms of like the normal person, they may never see a product that um, that one of your companies produced. Um, so, so there's a lot of that, but among all the things that you've seen, um, apart from what is already gaining traction, what else 
seems to be something that could be a permanent fixture in our society. What would be permanent that isn't already? Yeah, it's not already, mm. and it still doesn't, like, it, you, it's not clear that it will be. Oh. But you personally think that it will be. I mean, honestly, of all the things we've invested in, cellular um, agriculture focused on meat in particular is the only one that I would say is not a permanent fixture. Because all the other ones have product in the market with customers, whereas that is still not actually on the market. Um, and while it has a ton of interest and is the most like sexy and talked about of all the technologies, um, it still has the most risk attached to it. Um, and the ability to actually scale to be have any price parity, to have like structure to go from beyond like uh, kind of just cells that you clump together, like a ground beef type of concoction, into a structured filet or steak or anything like that. So that is the area where there's still the most technical challenges to be done, whereas all the other ones like um, we have a company, Gelcor, making collagen protein. They can actually make, they have bacteria, they can program to make any type of collagen. Um, they can actually make human collagen, and that's in cosmetics right now. You can buy that on the market. Um, What's so, the name of the company? Gelcor. Oh, Gelcor. Okay. They're B2B, so they're selling collagen to cosmetics. Also, collagen in nutrition is coming up. Um, so that's already real. Clara Foods is already scaling to provide egg protein to people. So meat is the area where it's still the most um, technological risk of everything I think has been done. Yeah, so I obviously agree with the clean meat idea, cultivated meat, however you want to call it. Um, but on top of that, something I really like to think about, um, I really like the idea of the, uh, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen, but I think that there, the kitchens are getting smaller and smaller to the point where you can think about, you know, a world where there are no more kitchens. And it's going to be all about, like, deliveries or all about, like, you know, uh, can you bio, like bioprint your own food or cultivate your own meat at home through like a bioprinter and do everything at home with just this? So, so I really like to think about technologies that are going really to disrupt like kitchen, right? Because you know, like you have to look at like our you know who are the next customers and and those are customers who Generation Z and millennials who especially Generation Z who want something that is more immediate and more um, convenient. So. Uh, I think that this is really a trend that's going to be very interesting to see, and it's already happening, so, yeah. Okay, and um, broadly speaking, what do you think is the greatest need or the greatest bottleneck uh, to making advancements in food tech? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start, I'll just, say that I'll just say that I think the biggest bottleneck is really a scale up at this point. So we talked a lot about, you know, cellular culture, cultivated meat, um, but, but more generally, I think that, that scaling up is, is a big challenge. So in the case of cultivated meat, you don't really have the right bioreactors yet that, where you can really produce it massively. Uh, you don't necessarily have the right you know, liquid media that's needed for the cells to grow uh, that is cost competitive. So I think scale up is a huge problem. And also um, on top of that, we have to add regulations that so uh, different you know, categories will have different types of regulations, especially you know, when it comes to meat or, or dairy products, if they're not if they don't come from an actual live animal, there are a lot of states right now that are passing labeling laws around this. Um, so we really have to really contend with, with this. And um, what about in, in academia? The, what, what are some bottlenecks actually in science, in academia, uh, that's, that's preventing us from achieving much more in food tech? Yeah, her. yeah. So that's interesting because I think that the real bottleneck right now in academia, if we want to have more food tech, is about um, early investment and sorry about funding. And and I think if you think about cultivated meat, for example, uh, this is some this, these are areas that have not been really developed for food. So they've been developed for regenerative medicine, uh, stem cells, uh, but still there is there's not enough that's getting into it. So startups are have to do a lot of their own R and D. Um, and this is why startups are very secretive about what they're doing, so they're not really sharing the knowledge between all the different cultivated meat startups, for example. So that, that is a problem. So if there was more research that was funded for this, then, then I think we would see the space moving faster. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have something. Yeah, I think I have, I have three things. Um, one would just be scale of infrastructure. So we're people who use fermenters and bioreactors. Um, if we were to make as much protein as people want to make in the world, we I don't think we, we don't have the equipment necessary to actually scale these technologies to produce it um, in mass. Um, I think for things that are non-bioreactor based, actually um, sourcing. So right now, there's a lot of reliance on a few different 
um, plants for a lot of protein. Pea protein is right now a bit like in vogue. I think mm -hmm. pumpkin is getting a little bit of attention. But how do we diversify like our ingredients a lot, which would help create a more resilient ecosystem and like um, food system in general. And then lastly, I'll look at regulations where subsidies are and where incentives are. Um, a lot of that is around. And good, um, we hosted a dinner yesterday on sustainability, and the speaker who was there, I think, said something really important. Um, it's like people, I think, confuse protecting jobs with protecting people. So we want to, I think, if we could make, you know, growing food and feeding the planet so efficient that there's, you know, it costs next to nothing, that would be great. We wouldn't have to, have, and it was roboticized, like automated, you know, using fermenters. Like that should be our goal, so people can be freed up to do other things. I think sometimes it's a confusion of like. We should be subsidizing and protecting industries because of the of those jobs, whereas we should think about those people and how we can you know best help them have a good life. And I think if the government thinks about it from that perspective, where you have food security in every country around the world and you have people who can make technology locally that's cheap, then that would kind of help us, you know, free us up to do other things. Grand vision. Um and then, so uh, just kind of to wrap this up, uh, for for young professionals and just general professionals in the audience, um, you know, looking to get into food tech or biotech, um, as well as biotech, food tech investing, where should they start? Um, what should they do? Do they need a multidisciplinary training background like yourselves? Um, you know, what sort of opportunities should they be going for? Are there any resources you want to share? Yeah, I mean, so my thought is like the same way like people who are not, you know, coders and computer, um, like software engineers contribute to IT companies, like there's all the different functions, like that's the same thing in every, you know, hard science field as well. So like going to meetups, going to events that are um, where founders and, and food tech companies are going and meeting people, talking to them, and just like getting involved. Everyone needs marketing, everyone needs sales. Um, graphic design, UI, UX, you know, whatever, you name it. Um, so if you want to get involved in the field, like, just go and meet people. Um, I think good resources, uh, probably, I mean, besides that, I'll definitely <laughs> shout out to you guys. Uh, uh, GFI, Good Food Institute, um, is a nonprofit that does um, a lot in the space, supports a bunch of companies, um, puts out a lot of free resources. I would go there. Um, and then if you want to get into investing, mm -hmm. I don't know, probably go to the same meetups, you'll probably meet investors from the funds there. <laughs> or the conferences if you can find a way to go to like a good GFI conference, culture meet symposium, what have you. Yeah, so I'll also say you have, you have to read Outfunder News, obviously. <laughs> um, the best resource out there. Uh, I love the GFI as well, and they're really doing an awesome job. It's, it's really amazing. Um, when it comes to the multidisciplinary thing, I really agree with everything you said. And on top of that, I would add that, that you know, when you're coming from the business side, try to learn a little bit more about the science and vice versa. So I, I feel like we have this problem when we talk to entrepreneurs, uh, we have this problem that if they come from academia, they, they have this like really great idea, really great project, really smart people, but then it doesn't make sense from a business perspective. Not that we don't love the science, but it doesn't like make any sense from like there is that from a cost perspective, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think that those guys really need to spend a little bit more time trying to really go an extra mile and like, you know, start with MBA for dummies, which I did. Um, and, uh, and really take like classes if you're from a university where you can do more of the business side. And on the flip side, um, there are a lot of really great entrepreneurs and business people and then they have a food, a food, start, a food tech startup or an ad tech startup. Um, and then when you ask them very basic questions, um, they, they will say, oh, well, let's schedule a call with my CTO, let's schedule a call with my CSO. And that's a little bit of a problem. We really want, we don't expect those people who are, you know, have MBAs to necessarily like be, you know, have PhDs as well in science, but we expect them to really understand the field. And some of them do. So sometimes you wouldn't necessarily guess until at least an hour into the call that this guy does not, or this woman does not have a, uh, does not have a background in science. So, yeah. One small thing. Um, just in terms of like knowing background of your industry, doing research on that. So like agriculture, there's a lot of kind of nuances of how things actually happen in the field in the real world. Like once you leave a lab or leave, like so like we don't have farms in San Francisco. You have to go and like understand how things happen there. And the same within like the food tech world, you know, 
trying to get an insight, get some mentors, or talk to people who tell you how do grocery stores like make buying decisions, what are purchasing decisions like there, um, how do big companies have supply chains set up and all that. So depending on what part of the system you want to kind of play in, try and do some background research on how, do, how does it kind of approach from both the startup angle and from the, you know, the, the multinational, like huge, huge people angle as well. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm curious. So within, so with with your different programs and networks and even ecosystems, what are what are your strengths? So like, you know, does your program have more? Does it connect your uh, startups with more industry people or maybe supply chain people? Like, you know, everyone has slightly different strengths, um, and I'm just curious to discover you you guys and to have shared with everyone. Um, sure. So I would say, you know, I'm always biased to ask our entrepreneurs and they'll tell you, you know, in a more fair way than I will. Um, so for us, we, we have a big network within industry, government, VCs, all that. Um, I think our focus is to really, um, it's not about making a pitch deck in a story where you can fundraise off of. It's really like putting, uh, you know, even for all the vegans out there, meat on the bone. Um, so really thinking about how do you make that jump? Um, got one laugh. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a higher laugh too. Yeah, it was a big laugh, but you know, some of yeah. us were like um, laughing inside. So. Yeah. so, and this isn't always the case, but how do you help first-time founders or first-time biotech founders kind of get the foundations in, in all the categories you have to have? So most thinking about product-directed science, business development, customer discovery to kind of go hand in hand with that and work in parallel. Um, learning communication, management, leadership skills, and then translate that into storytelling and fundraising. So it's really around um, framing it off of, though this isn't true for everyone, coming from academia, where you work at um, a different pace and you have a different, like more curious discovery-minded approach to science. Like if you're working at, at this type of speed, um, how do you for four months go at a sprint that's like at this intensity, knowing that you won't keep it up forever, but you know that is what you're capable of, or you settle somewhere in the middle, you kind of have a new set of skills and a new baseline how you operate. So I think that is kind of a, an underlying part of how we want to de-risk all parts of the company. Yeah, so I think that what we really can contribute is the same, like really the network. Um, so so really Agfinder, as, as I mentioned earlier, they really build an entire reputation and brand. And so it's all about really the, the fact that, you know, we, Agfinder became kind of the expert in, in experts in agriculture. So we've worked with they work with consulting firms, uh, with uh, people in the industry. So really, we know they know people from the entire <laughs> supply chain. I know some of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, we know. Let's say this. Let's say this. So we know a lot of people like throughout the supply chain. We really, you know, everybody really recognizes the name in the industry, and so we can really make introductions uh, and facilitate like really follow up with with um, with entrepreneurs. Yeah, she mentioned you know the. Um, for those who are not too familiar with VC, like VC is not just about writing checks, right? It's about a relationship that's going to last for 10 years. Um, and so a lot about it is, is what's happening after this.